Mm. So are we live? Can I guess pass it? I I don't know whether we are live. <laughs> yes, yes, we are live. We are? And... Okay, brilliant. <laughs> uh, evening, everyone who's been able to uh, join us. Um, I was not sure whether we were live, uh, but I've been told we are live. So thank you so much for creating time for uh, joining us for, to, for this part too. I can see a couple of uh, names from the previous session and I'm seeing some names which are new. I'm really happy that we've also been able to secure uh, our two speakers uh, from the previous session, Dr. Kenny Karanja and Mary Neroy. So we're going to have a good uh, session. Um, we are recording the session, so for those uh, who will not be able to join, I think you'll get the opportunity to review these or if you want to have a look at it. The session is only an hour long, and I'd like to ensure that we answer as many of your questions as possible. So please, if you've been thinking about this session, if you've been having sleepless, uh, I don't say sleepless nights, but at least if you've been dreaming about this session and you've been having questions since we had the initial conversation, I will request you to start uh, putting together some questions and you can type them in the chat. Uh, Fidi is going to be helping me in terms of uh, keeping tabs of those questions. In terms of how uh, we're going to structure this session, let me share my screen quickly here. Um, I'm going to take the first couple of minutes just to do a recap of the session we had. And then once we are done with that uh, recap, I will then uh, start out. Yeah, uh, I'll do a very quick uh, recap of the discussions we had last time. Then once we are done with that, I will invite my two amazing speakers to join and then we can continue from our point. Uh, so this is part two. Um, uh, the the uh, part one is uh, we had it two weeks ago. And we've recorded it. And I think, Phyllis, you're going to be sharing the, the, the recording link just in case someone would like to review that. Uh, it's available on YouTube. We put it on our YouTube page. So you can be able to review that there if you'd like after the session. Um, yeah. OK, so this is part two. So let me just uh, jump in. Uh, we're going to finish at 5, not at uh, 5.30. We want to keep it short and sweet. Uh, and also, we have people from different time zones, and we want them to be able to jump onto the other activities uh, they have. So just to get uh, started for, if you're joining us for the first time here, uh, the session is being hosted by Victoria Ventures. Um, uh, Victoria Ventures is a Kenyan uh, company that is looking to de de democratize the ac access to capital. So we principally work with innovators uh, and uh, investors and try to support uh, both of them to come closer to be able to make uh, deals. Uh, and that's through our work under program management and our work in consulting. So we do lots of programs focus on either entrepreneurs or investors, and we do a lot of advisory work that supports investors and entrepreneurs to be able to work together. Um, and uh, we also run our own angel network, which gives us a very good understanding of the ecosystem of investing and supports also some of the entrepreneurs we're working with in terms of being able to raise funding. Um, so far, we've uh, been able to work with over 2,000 entrepreneurs directly. Um, and uh, you know through our angel network, we deploy over $2 million. Uh, those startups have raised an additional $15 million. Very proud of uh, the work that we're doing around that. You can find out more about us on our website. And just to mention a few things, the conversation we're having today is part of the R2C program, uh, which we are running. And it's uh, in partnership with uh, Kenya and uh, is funded by RISA through the UK International Development. And the key thing we're trying to do is one, to support innovators to be able to commercialize innovations. Um, because we know there's, a lo there's lots of innovators in different universities across uh, across the continent, actually, not across Kenya, across the continent, who are looking to commercialize innovations and they feel that they lack either the knowledge, uh, capacity, networks um, to be able to do this. So we're trying to support uh, through that in the program, the R2C program. And secondly, is also to strengthen the institutions because a quite a number of the innov innovations we're talking about come from our institutions. And so what we are doing around, uh, you know, working with the institutions is supporting them in terms of having a trainers of trainers uh, program that is working with uh, different uh, TTO officers, uh, working with champions who are teaching entrepreneurship courses and so forth, and supporting them to understand or at least get uh, different viewpoints around uh, how to commercialize the innovation. Uh, for the innovators, we have a program that we run with them and we select uh, innovators that we work with over um, you know, over a six month period uh, and really just look to uh, impart a lot of knowledge, uh, lots of coaching and introduce them to the market for them to be able to, um, you know, look to create partnerships, uh, look to, you know, raise funding that is going to be able to support them to be able to uh, 
uh, commercialize and fundraise, fundraise and commercialize for the innovations. So just a few elements, I think I've mentioned a few of these, so I'm not gonna spend so much time on these. Uh, the program has been very interesting. You can find out more on our website or on Kenya's website. There's a specific page that is uh, put out uh, just for the R2C program. So very quickly, I wanted to do a recap of part one um, because I want us to spend more time with our speakers as opposed to listening to me because the speakers were amazing and that's why people say they wanted to have a part uh, two. But uh, the quick uh, recap of uh, part one, just uh, you know, co-founders are very important. Um, one, if you want to create a unicorn, uh, most unicorns have co-founders, uh, but very important if you're creating a high growth uh, company, which is going to attract investors, investors like co-founders. Uh, they like co-founders because that's succession uh, to a certain extent. They like co-founders because that means you have a bigger skill set uh, that you bring into the business, it's not just yourself as a founder, you have other people that you can work with, which will bring a certain skill set. And ideally, uh, who are going to stay there for long, right? Uh, and I, I did mention this also in the, the, the space that I operate in. I'm also a founder in a, you know, in, in, in a startup. And I found that, you know, having a solid co-founder who brings in different skill sets makes you sleep well at night because, you know, there's certain elements of the business which are handled and you don't have to worry whether someone will get poached, whether someone will leave and so forth because they are there, uh, they have uh, skin in the game um, and, you know, they work just as many hours as we do to be able to move the company forward. So, Co-founders are useful from that perspective. Uh, Dr. Kennedy did walk us through different types of co-founders and I found this very interesting. Um, and these were drivers, builders, and guides. Uh, drivers focus on the business side, uh, the structure, the legal, the financials, uh, in this case. Uh, then builders, they handle more of the technical aspects of the business, uh, maybe give them sort of like the operations, the product developments, and so forth. And um, then, you know, you have the guides, uh, in this case, who join much later when you're looking to scale uh, the company. And they join at a senior level, they have a lot of strategic experience and their whole idea is just how do they scale uh, the organization. And so you did need to ask yourself whether you need, uh, you know, a, a builder who's going to help you to build the organization, whether you need a guide who's going to sort of like uh, join at the scaling level. So at different levels, you'd need different types of uh, co-founders in this case. Um, we did also just discuss about uh, at the same point here about uh, when to get uh, a co-founder uh, in this case, or, you know, at what point you need to think about getting a co-founder. And Mary here also shared that she's in that journey, that she's looking to get a co-founder, but uh, part of the reasoning behind that, uh, behind that being that she, she's really utilized the resources that she has, the networks that she has, and she's uh, pushed the startup to a point where she feels that she, she has some integral bits around that. Uh, and the whole idea is that now she's looking to see how she can be able to scale her vision. And she needs someone who can help in terms of the fundraising journey and also just to scale this vision, right? So it's good to ask yourself as a founder, at what point you bring in a co-founder? It's not always that you need a co-founder. There are times that you can drive the bus a bit further before you invite someone else to support you in terms of uh, that journey. Uh, the other uh, thing is just to remember some of the key points around identifying the co-founder that you'll be having for your entity. And we mentioned that one of the key important things is uh, the values and the vision. And just make sure that you're aligned around that. And I could not uh, underscore that further. Because you can have someone who's very technically gifted, uh, someone who's very sharp, has very good connections. But if your values and your visions are not aligned, you will end up breaking apart. And uh, I, I did mention this. Uh, there's a quote I like from uh, the founder's uh, dilemma by Noam or someone who's a book. And it says, if startups were like battlefields, most of the casualty would result from friendly fire than from enemy fire. Uh, meaning that uh, most startups that end up failing, if you look at one of the key reasons they fail, is because of fights between the co-founders. So, you know, values alignment, visual alignment, very important. Uh, of course, complementary skills, very important that you make sure that at least you're bringing people who are complementing you. So you don't want to have, I mean, if you're very good technically and you can solve most of the technical issues, you don't have more technical things, you probably want to think about getting someone uh, who's more commercial in this case uh, from our perspective. And then this idea of vetting co-founders uh, thoroughly, um, you know, this is like, you know, you know it's like you're getting a life partner, uh, more or less. So, you know, make sure you vet them um, and it's not just, you know, make sure you know who recommended them, where they were working before, or who they were engaged with before. I think Dr. Kenny gave us a story of just, uh, you know, putting them on Google and just seeing what comes up in this case and reaching out to see, uh, you know, what they've done in their background in this case. So very important to think about that. Um, challenges of co-founder relationship, relationship, I think I spoke about misaligned expectations, where you're not clear about uh, where you're going. Communication and accountability, very, very important. 
Um, and this just speaks to the point that <clears throat> you want to, just similar to any um, relationship that you might have, and I guess the best one to think about is a marriage type of relationship. If you're not communicating regularly, if you don't have a methodology of discussing how do you keep each other accountable, how do you ensure that if there are things which are not working, what's the dispute resolution mechanism, right? Uh, very important to have that and to think about because you're going to have disputes, you're going to have uh, challenges. So how do you resolve that? Do you sort of like sit uh, on a weekly basis to discuss just uh, where the company is going? Uh, if there's any issues, um, is there a process that you've put uh, out in terms of how you resolve that? Um, you know, you have a board of advisors that you have to sort of like speak too fast before you can move on to someone else. It's such an important piece, and I'm thinking about this because I've gone through uh, a certain, certain joint venture that we had, which broke apart, and we didn't have a good dispute resolution mechanism. So one person thought that if things were not working out, the idea was to terminate. Uh, while we were thinking, if it's not working out, let's just have a conversation and let's just try and improve uh, in this case. And just that uh, difference in terms of thinking about how to resolve conflict uh, was catastrophic for the joint venture that we had. So, you know, having regular goal setting and uh, post decision reviews, I think um, this also came from uh, Kenny uh, in this case. Then uh, we did discuss about what's a typical equity compensation. And this is the American view, which uh, Kenny shared. Uh, but the most important thing was to base this on the role that the person is coming to play, uh, the contributions they are putting uh, in this case, are they putting uh, any financial contributions? Uh, are they bringing specific types of uh, business or contracts that would be very useful for this? I mean, what contribution exactly are they bringing? And uh, the engagement level, right? How engaged are they? Are they full-time? Are they part-time? Whatever it might be in this case. Um, and, you know, are they adding that uh, value? Uh, but uh, just a base in this case, if uh, if you have been active founders, uh, five to ten percent. When you have active founders, um, you know the drivers they may receive even thirty to one percent. Uh, in this case, uh, we did discuss vesting schedules, and if you are new to vesting schedules, this is just a schedule that shows at what point you get shares in the company. So the fact that we've agreed that uh, as a commercial co-founder, as a co-founder was joining the organization. We're going to give you 20% for argument's sake. It doesn't mean you get it today. Uh, it means that you need to do certain things or it, there, there needs to be a certain amount of time elapsed for you to be able to gain those shares. And uh, we spoke about this concept of having a one-year cliff, where for the first one year, there are no shares which are going to be allocated. Uh, but then after the first one year, maybe there's a 20% of the 20% I spoke about earlier, which is 4% in this case, uh, that gets allocated. And then the rest of the 20%, which is 16%, maybe get allocated over the next uh, four years uh, in this case. So that, that, that could be an example in this case. Of course, all these things are negotiated and you do need to get some legal advice to support you in this. But the principle is don't give the shares on day one uh, because once you've given shares to an individual, to an entity, um, you know you can't wake up the next day and tell them I want the shares back. Like, it doesn't work like that uh, because they own uh, the, the company in this case and the process of getting all, them off the shareholders register or the cap table is much more complex uh, than that. Uh, we did also mention the role of partners, and I think uh, Mary spoke about this uh, a lot and the kind of support she received from incubators and accelerators, especially Techstars, and they've more or less acted as her co-founder to a certain extent by answering a lot of the questions that she has and filling a lot of the gaps that she has. Um, and so, you know, it's not always that you need uh, the co-founder at the beginning, but some of these institutions can help you a lot to push the company a bit further before then you decide that you need to bring in a partner who's going to support you in the next uh, steps. Um, and then just the last uh, bits in this case, of course, co-founders uh, add a lot of value. Uh, make sure you have the tough conversations uh, as, as early as you can. And then, you know, we spoke about the external programs. And yeah, uh, those were our two speakers and they're here today. So thank you very much. That's a quick uh, recap. Uh, I am going to stop sharing and uh, invite my two speakers now so that we can get started. I did request, if you have any questions, I would like to respond much more to, to your questions than for me to frame the questions. But maybe I'll start by asking Mary and Kenny, and Mary, we can start with you. Um, anything from the recap or any, uh, I don't say observation, any reflections? Uh, you have from the previous conversation that you want to start with uh, just to set uh, the scene before we can uh, jump to the Q&A. Uh, so I'll start with, with you, Mary, and then we can move to Dr. Kenny, same question. Mm -hmm. 
thank you once again for for this conversation. I I still have a rusty voice. It's, it's, the weather in Nairobi is very cold, so it's fluctuating. So again, I was hoping to to have a more what can I call it? But I hope you can hear me, right? So just to talk about one thing I want to talk about is the investing schedule for co-founders, and also just to speak about having an intellectual property protection strategy, because my assumption is these entrepreneurs who have these ideas could either be in universities and or working in maybe having their master's degree or their researchers and want to have a co-founder who's in the business side. So, and because the researchers are the ones who have the idea, it's very important for these entrepreneurs first to have good counsel or rather good legal teams to help them to structure intellectual property assignments and having an intellectual property uh, protection strategy. So that in case, in case there's a fallout between the co-founders, then the intellectual property, the assets of the company are protected, but you know, there's no, as you said in the previous, um, the previous webinar that there were there were there was a fallout between two co-founders and then the company just ended. And if one of the one of the founders has the idea and if there was no protection for that asset, then that could be a problem. So that's a reflection I think should be very looked upon and which could be a, an issue for a, for a sudden fallout between founders. Thanks, Mary. Uh, yeah. uh, th 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 Penny, just before you uh, jump sure. in, uh, thanks, Mary, for that. And Mary, maybe in 30 seconds, you could just remind you, just in case there's someone else who's joined in who was not there for the first session, just in 30 seconds, uh, you know, uh, about yourself. I forgot to ask that. You should have started with that uh, just in 30 seconds. I'm so sorry. Also, I should have done that when I started. So my name is Mary Nyaroi. I am the founder. I'm a solo founder, and I'm also actively looking for a co-founder who has skin in the game when it comes to the fast moving consumer goods because our company has innovated sanitary pads from pineapple leaves and maize husk fibers. So that's my introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Dr. Kenny, over to you. Start with the quick intro and then you can jump onto your reflection since uh, we last spoke. Awesome. So yeah, uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Kenny Karanja. I am a technology licensing officer at the University of Minnesota. And my role uh, as a tech transfer officer is to catalyze reactions. And I will geek out just a little bit here for the scientists in, on this call. So as you can remember, catalysts are not part of the reaction itself, but they speed up the reaction by bringing down the Gibbs free energy of activation. So essentially we help our academic founders to transition their intellectual property as Mary's mentioned from the bench to the commercial space through the development of a product. And that is of course done through a startup. Uh, and having said that, I will echo Mary's point about uh, getting the right co-founders and that particular IP space, having a good IP strategy. And how that feeds into your selection of a, a co-founder is you want someone who is very intelligent, who can bring in the, uh, uh, bridge the gaps that are there uh, you, from you as a scientific founder. You want someone who is very hardworking because it's not easy. We talked about part one. This is a more than full-time endeavor. You're talking 60, 80 hours a week. So a little, <laughs> woe unto you if you get a co-founder that is not hardworking. And finally, you want one that is ethical. And to Mary's point, you don't want someone to come in and run off with the IP if things don't work out. You want an ethical person. However, if uh, you do not find an intelligent uh, co-founder or a hardworking one, and the only one you can, make, you can find is an unethical one, make sure that that unethical one is extremely lazy and not very intelligent, because <laughs> otherwise you will be in a lot of trouble. Uh, well, that that went left field. <laughs> you, you, uh, I expected to say if you find one that is non-ethical, 
uh, and uh, please run away. But uh, I guess uh, make sure they are very lazy on top of that. <laughs> I'm all for ensuring that the people you have in the bus have yes. a role in the bus. When we facilitate right. sessions for our R2C, um, uh, the, the accelerator, we always tell uh, people that, we always ask this question. It's a hypothetical question, and it's just meant to get people thinking. Uh, if you are to organize a bank robbery, who, do you, who would you go for? Who would you go with? <laughs> right? Uh, right? I'm glad to mention that uh, I'm never picked uh, in this uh, setting. <laughs> but I know that's a good thing. But people select different people. Uh, and uh, then we ask the uh, next question that we ask is, why would you select this person? And every person who's selected is because, you know, they're a very good driver. Uh, I don't know, they used to work in uh, banking before. Uh, I don't know, they used to work in security before, so they understand the security apparatus, or they are very resourceful uh, because they know how to get into sticky situation, get, get away from sticky situations and so forth. And we use an, that analogy just to say that any person that you bring into your team needs to have a critical role that they're playing, right? Uh, they cannot be that it's because they're my friend, right? And we always joke, joke about it. Nobody says, I'm going to bring in this person to the robbery that you're organizing because they're my really good friend. Uh, or because we study together. Nobody ever says that, right? And I guess the analogy, you get the analogy in this case. Okay, cool. Um, so let me start out uh, on the questions that uh, have been asked. And then I also have a few questions just to continue the conversation. So the first one is a simple one. Um, there's an anonymous attendee who's uh, saying, Mary, can I get in touch with you? I'd like to apply for Texters. And I think that should be okay. Mary, if you don't mind, or maybe if, if also for you, Dr. Kenny, if you're comfortable, you could drop in your email address. And if someone would like to reach out on something that you can be able to assist with, uh, then you could be able to do that. Mm -hmm. That's one. Um, and then uh, let's move to the other question by Moses Figa, uh, who's from um, Kabarak University. And so Moses asks a very good question. And he says, when valuing contributions, how would you weigh the IP versus the time versus uh, the financial mm -hmm. contribution, right? Um, and, uh, and and maybe let, let's start with yourself, Mary, if you don't mind. In your journey, when you're thinking about bringing someone, you've done a lot of work already. Uh, you've created a certain level of IP uh, for your startup. You've made a lot of traction. So when you're thinking about the person you're bringing on board, and of course, this drives towards the equity conversation, how do you value the, the, that worth that they're bringing in this case to be able to then figure out what kind of equity, uh, or at least what are the considerations you have before you hear from Kenny how they look at it? So I'm assuming because Moses, from what I'm hearing, could be in campus right now. So there's something that- no, Moses call... is a doctor. He's a doctor, uh, Moses uh, Figure. He's in campus as a as a faculty, as a faculty. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I just happened to know him, yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dr. Terry. It was, it was not intentional. But yeah. just to backtrack, I wanted to say that there's something that we call sweat equity. And this, this happens when you're just starting out. So you have an idea and you have somebody who's also very passionate and have, has been sold into the vision. So at that time, maybe you're bootstrapping and bootstrapping here means you're collecting money from your friends, your savings to really build the business to a certain point. And that at that particular time, of course, you cannot pay yourself, which happened to me when I was beginning. So you have this person who is contributing their time, their effort, you're having meetings, you're meeting all these people. So when you're gauging contribution, you can say, this person really worked hard with me when we started. So you compensate them based on the time that they spent. And that is what we call sweat equity. So that is a conversation you should have with this person. And then now, if you've already developed the IP, that's where you come into that conversation for, if you're the technical person who has the IP, then you have to bring somebody who has the business acumen side, because then from my understanding, you don't need somebody who's bringing uh, more IP or rather more ideas into, into the product that you're creating if it is already something that has already matured. But if it is something that is initial, then you should get somebody who's technical and especially for African founders because we have limiting technologies to be able to scale up innovations. So looking for people who can be able to bring um, a certain ingredient or a way of making the process much simpler, optimizing the process, 
which you can add into the IP. So that is what you should be looking at when you're trying to have the conversations for IP. I hope I've answered the question. No, uh, yeah. so thanks for that. Um, and maybe can you just take it away? I'll continue. Yeah. Right. So, so the, the question is about the contribution or the uh, IP time and resources. So the way we view that, and, and this is from a space where most of our researchers are high-performing academicians, which comes with its own specific challenges. So our advice at the founding round is that the value, it's the prospective value that the person is bringing in to the company, not the so-called, uh, you can call it, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the technical term, it might come back to me, sunk cost, yeah. So it's not a sunk cost. What you have prior to that startup has value, yes, but when you do the startup, you're doing prospective value. You're trying to align the company and the contributions to what people bring in going forward. So at that point, and I think there was a point made about uh, uh, sweat equity. So the sweat equity might be past or future. So if you are a founder who is actively going to be participating in the company, and sometimes that might call for resignation from your uh, academic position, then you might be entitled to a higher equity position in the startup. However, if you are a founder and you're comfortable in your uh, day job and you're not going to be actively participating in the startup, then you might not lay claim to significant amounts of equity because the people who are coming in might be more inclined to spend their time and resources in the company, which is okay. It's all these, as uh, Stephen said, they are negotiated, but... The, the baseline is how much time and effort are you putting into the company going forward, not uh, past. Maybe Kenny, just to flesh uh, that uh, point a bit more. Um, so I, and, and I'll give you uh, a scenario, right? Um, right? And we could even use uh, the one for Mary, but let me use a different one. So we have innovators right now in our R2C. Uh, some of them have innovated something um, and uh, they have just finalized uh, negotiating a licensing agreement from the university, where right. then they're going to license these through their own company, and then they can be able to take this to market. So it's not the university inside that is doing the spin-off, uh, right. so to say. Uh, now, within that new entity they've created, they want to bring in a co-founder to support them to be able to take this to market. Right Now, their challenge is, I've already done all this stuff. I Quote, unquote, right now, I control 100%. Right. That's my kick. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> you know, someone else, your know, mail controls 100%. <laughs> and someone else now wants a slice of that kick. So from day zero, do I give them a 5% uh, stick? Is that enough for them? Uh, do I give All them right. 95% uh, in this case? And, I, you know, just to create context about this uh, discussion, uh, last week we were at the field summit and uh, we had this uh, interesting debate where, you know, we we're asking who should be getting a bigger chunk of the revenues that come out of commercialization. Is this the university? Is it the innovator uh, in this case, right? And if you use this as a, as a proxy, so varied views, uh, and I was arguing for the university on this specific day, which was <laughs> not uh, what I, <laughs> I believe uh, in this case. But, but, but one of the viewpoints that came out of this, I'm just creating context to the question, is that execution is almost everything. Right? Yes, we could have all the technology we have, but if we don't take it to market, uh, it's you know it, the value is nothing, right? Um, right. But right. then there's still work that has been done, right? When it becomes something, uh, we can always go back and say the product was a critical part of this because if we didn't have the product, then we couldn't have executed, right? right. So yeah. that, that's the context of the question as you're sort of like thinking about the answer. So uh, back to you, uh, Kenny. And then we yeah. ask Mary what she's thinking about giving her co-founder in this case so that you can see whether we want to apply for that. Right. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's a very good good question. And it all depends. I think at, at one point, maybe in the last session, we introduced this as the, the entities or startups are very different. It could be a mom and pop shop. It could be a mid-tier, low-tech company. It could be a very high-tech company. So it depends on the starting point of the company. So if the company already has a close to go to market product, then you know whoever is coming in prospectively, remember we are looking at prospective value, they may not be adding too much value into it. 
they, and I think that might be Mary's position, they're they not going to give out 10, 20% of the company. However, if it's really high tech in um, thinking uh, non, uh, semiconductor space, therapeutics, uh, high tech engineering, battery technology development, things like that, green energy, those require significant amount of resources and technology development. So your co-founders might need to take significant uh, equity in the company. So it's all about perspective, knowing what you have currently and what you are going to have in future. It's, I, I like using this analogy uh, within the Kenyan context of we, we are uh, uh, plot maji maji, right? People buy plots, they like land. But, you know, it's a piece of land that you can't claim, oh, I will build a building here for 100 million. And so you should pay me 150 million. No, it, that, it's not, that's not the context. However, if you already have a building, then yes, you can claim that. So it's all about where you're at when you're bringing in your co-founder. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Mary, we want to become your co-founder. <clears throat> what are you giving us and why are you giving whatever you're thinking of giving in this case? So before I answer your question, I'd like to, there's somebody who has asked about how much, what, what do you do to protect your idea? from somebody stealing it. And I need to emphasize this point. When you have the idea of, of making a product or that high-tech uh, product that Dr. Kenny is talking about, it is important that any, any person who comes into close contact with your idea should sign a confidentiality agreement or something I know most of you mm -hmm. know as uh, an NDA. And then after that, of course, you should have the um, IP assignments so that in case you have a co-founder who leaves before the investing schedule mm -hmm. goes or rather expires, then they have already assigned the IP to the company and it does not belong to them. So that's very mm -hmm. important. So before, once you found a co-founder, you have agreed, both of you should sign IP assignments to the company. So that's the first thing that should happen. And if you have any contractors, for example, you could have people who you work with for two months because of the, the project. And if you, those are consultants as well, they should also sign IP agreements because if they're in close contact with the technology that you're using. So I hope I answered that question from Faith. Then about the, how much equity I would be giving my co-founder, uh, ideally how startups work, and you mentioned something about a cap table, which shows how much equity, you know, investors are getting once they get shares from the company. We have something called an employee, a uh, SO, so an employee uh, stock option, uh, stock ownership mm -hmm. plan. So ideally, investors want to see that maybe you have 10% to 20% of the stock in the company for future employees. Now, if you're a co-founder, for example, who is beginning, in, where you're starting the business with this person, then ideally it's normally maybe one of you should decide who's getting the majority of the share. So you begin with either 51 and 49%. And then as you continue diluting the company, of course, you have the 10 to 20% going to ESOP. So you continue diluting your shares depending on who you are bringing into the company and also the investors. So it is very, very important. So ideally, it's the person who brings the idea who has to think about how much equity am I willing to give the co-founder and mm -hmm. how much equity will I be giving the future employees who are coming into the company. So again, mm -hmm. um, based on that, it's my own prerogative, of course, with, with my legal counsel to see how much to give to the future co-founder that we get. Thank you, Mary. I, was, uh, I took my pen to write it down to see whether it will be worth my while, <laughs> but no. But thanks for the consideration that you're right in this case. Um, and I like what also Dr. Kenny mentioned in terms of the level of traction you've made, right? Um, you know, at the moment you raise some funding, uh, you have a product, etc. So it's very different if you're having the same conversation uh, when you're getting started uh, in this case. Uh, but I, I do also like this point that it's important for you to paint a picture of how do we get to commercialization and proper commercialization in this case? So if you have, uh, if you're an innovator today, you want to have uh, a route to market which says, you know, between now and having these uh, in stores and being, I don't know, a hundred million uh, shilling product uh, per year, right? A million dollar product uh, per year in the uh, market that we're in. What does it take, right? 
then on that basis, you can be able to get a sense of, you know, based on where I am and where I need to get to, this is, and if someone is bringing a majority of that, then it gives you a sense of how much you should give them in this case. But if they're not bringing a majority of that, then you have a, a challenge. I know we're not giving specific numbers, but also we are very varied innovation. So we can only speak about uh, principles in this case. Okay, so um, there's a few questions which have uh, come in. Uh, and let me just see if I can pick uh, one or two of them. So uh, Ayub says, uh, how do you define roles? Right. So we've brought uh, someone else, uh, into the company. What is their role going to be and how do we define things? Am I the CEO? So, you know, it's been my company, it's been my baby. Do I remain as the CEO and they have to report to me? Do they become the CEO? And how do we define roles uh, in this case? Uh, uh, Ken? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So the roles are dependent on what that person will be doing in the company initially. So for example, our academic startups, more often than not, the inventor uh, is the founder and CEO. It, very initial, uh, we would say, what first two, three, four years, uh, the inventor, founder, CEO. However, when you start bringing it in, because they are at that point, they're still doing research is highly technical. If you move on to the next phase, which is bringing in a business person to really drive, uh, as we mentioned earlier, drive that company forward, then that means that that person will most likely be the CEO. They are going to be spending a lot of time thinking about the company. And then the initial founder, initial founder slash CEO becomes a chief scientific officer. And embedded in that requirement actually are things that might be out of scope for this conversation are conflict of interest considerations. If you are still an academic employee of your university and still in the company, we frown upon you being the CEO just because now you, your conflicts are much more significant. So that's the context we br you bring in a business person, they're going to move the business aspects forward, they're most likely going to be the uh, CEO. Then past five years, you're looking at commercial progression, commercial development. You might want a COO, chief operations officer, who's now looking at a scale up supply chain product development. And initially, those three are quite, uh, depending on the growth of your company, those are the three key uh, C-suit positions that we look at. And finally, you'll probably... Uh, looking at investment actually before COO, you might be getting in uh, outside capital, which we call smart money. Remember the initial capital, we call it friends, family, and fools. Now you're getting sophisticated money. You might want to have a chief financial officer and then chief operations officer when you're scaling up your product. So those are the four major C, C roles that we envision in our startups. Uh, th th thanks for that. Um, and just to, as, as looking at the questions uh, as you're continuing, and I like the fact that, you know, it depends on what someone is coming to bring onto the table, then you'll allocate that. But just as a quick follow-up to that, assuming they become the CEO, does that mean that they get to boss you around? No. Uh, and, and you did mention uh, that you have some very highly accomplished uh, right. scientists, and, right. you know, uh, no one bosses them around. And now you have a <laughs> new CEO. What happens? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, relationship expectations need to be adjusted uh, because the CEO doesn't boss anybody around, otherwise they wouldn't be a good CEO. However, there are certain considerations, and I think, Mary, you mentioned them about assigning IP to the company. You are now all working for a legal entity called the company. So the company and the, the part of the CEO's mandate is to make sure the interests of the company are first and foremost. So you have to align your expectations and you align your views at that point and know that you are uh, you are reporting to a board. At that point, if you have smart money, you have a board of directors, which the CEO has to report to. So there's an element of doing what the CEO is asking, but you have to understand why you are doing that thing. And yeah, that's a very good. We, we make sure that our academic founders understand that concept for sure. Um, uh, Mary, are you ready for a new CEO? <laughs> <laughs> Just before I answer that question, I'd like to add on to what Dr. Kenny has said about being a researcher in a, in a university or conflict of interest. It would be very prudent if you are a researcher working in an organization and you have, you have created a, an idea or a, pro, or a product to speak to the university first when you start working on the 
product because um, once you start working on idea on an idea when you're working inside the university, then of course they will say that the idea belongs to them. So it should be very there should be um, a clear definition of who owns the idea so that you don't have a conflict of interest. And I I, I hope is something that maybe Dr. Ken you can speak about having those kind of agreements when you're a researcher or an innovator working. Um, in, in an organization that could potentially steal mm -hmm. or say that because you are using company time and company resources, then that idea belongs to us and not you. Right. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, you, you're very right. Uh, oftentimes, when the university owns the IP and then transfers it to the company via license agreement, those are the considerations that are written into that contractual obligation. And, uh, and the way we construct it, at least in U.S. universities, once that asset transfers to the company, any add-on technologies that come from the performance of that company will be owned by the company. However, you have a good point you made. Uh, the founder at that point, let's say they've become the CSO, Chief Scientific Officer, they still have to work with their university to make sure that the university either can lay claim in the context where it has the rights to lay uh, those claims, or sometimes what we see our founders do is they present this and say, we don't believe what the university owns this, what's your position? And then we say, okay, we don't own it. We write a letter of you know uh, allocation of rights, and then the company is good to go. But you have a good point. Make sure you document that progression of rights, because when you get the smart money those investors will want to know your IP position and who owns what where. And the worst case scenario is to have a company that doesn't have that clear line of ownership. We often encourage our founders, don't shy away. The, the idea is not to stop you from being successful, but rather to facilitate that uh, success by making sure there is a fair distribution of uh, uh, up, upsides. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, now, just continuing on the questions, I, I mentioned that today I'll focus a lot on the questions which are, which are being asked. One of the themes I'm picking from the questions are themes of uh, conflict, right? What happens when things don't go as expected? And as we mentioned, this could happen, right? It happens a lot uh, of times in this case. Um, and maybe starting with you, uh, Mary, uh, what's your plan? You know, you want to bring in a co-founder I'm sure you've given some thought in terms of, you know, if someone comes in, they're not performing to the expectations that you have or whatever, you know, things are not moving as you expected them to go in this case. They're not a, they're not a bad person in this case, but you need to terminate things. So what, you know, how do you get out of this and how do you manage that situation? So one of the things that we mentioned was um, about the values. Somebody has to be this person who, and potentially bring into the company must be sold into the vision of the company. We'll be bringing a lot of competence in the areas that you know need the gaps that need to be filled in the role that they're coming to take. So when it comes to us, we need somebody who has skin in the game in the fast moving manufacturing, I mean, consumer goods. So we are talking about sanitary pads because they understand the landscape of how these products move in the market. So when you're looking at this person, it's about how many um, years they have in experience in this market, um, the companies that we worked with before, the, the, you know, the relationships they had with the employees. So it's doing a lot of due diligence. And then I, I saw this quote the other day that said that with every relationship, you'll always find reasons to leave but you better look for the reasons to make you stay. Mm -hmm. So for example, if this person, um, for lack of a better word, is a very good worker, he's hardworking, he's honest, and you know, he has, he's bringing you know, connections, he's making the product move into the market. And once in a while, I see him smoking and I hate people who smoke. Then I'll be like, if it's, it's because you smoke and I, I don't like smoking, but you're doing these things for the company that are right. And as long as you're respectful to the culture of the company, and maybe when you're smoking, you're going outside, then realize that I will not let you work for the company because you're smoking, right? So you, you have to look at the things you're willing to compromise 
as well, that you don't actually negate um, the work that these people are bringing, but, and then for, for something very small. So look at those issues and find out what you are willing to compromise. Thanks, uh, Kenny, same question. And then maybe just a few more thoughts around uh, DD. I know we spoke about it last year, but maybe you can take a bit more time in terms of how you know um, you relate that DD process to how you manage that relationship going forward. And I know we spoke about vesting and all that, uh, but even when you've done all this stuff, you know, relationships do go bad. Uh, how, what's, a, what's a mitigation strategy in this case? Um, and how do you, I guess, ensure that the company does not collapse? Uh, because right. then you've had this certain face, maybe to, to the CEO in this case, the person that you brought in on board, and now they've fallen off and the market's just like, what's happening? Is the product still good, etc.? Right. Uh, so one part is to make sure that your board of directors is keen, keyed into what the company is doing. Do not negate or neglect uh, having a cadence of meetings. Uh, that the frequency of which you know you as a company has to decide, but we recommend at least once or twice every year, you are meeting with your board, giving them updates of where the company is, understanding what challenges and opportunities opportunities lay ahead and reporting up to the board because the board will, here we are assuming you as the founder has an issue with one of the other executives so that the board can understand where you are at and they'll help you manage that conversation. So report, uh, updates are critical being open to, to the board, of course, you are at with the challenges and opportunities. Understanding what the, you are in there, as Mary said, what are you in there for? What is this company supposed to do? And also having ethics as a primary consideration. I know I opened with that joke, but it is critical that people behave ethically within that organization. Remember, especially if you, there was a question about exit, exit strategies. If you're going to exit that company and the, the news out there is negative, you are going to have a hard time exiting that company. So you want to make sure that ethics plays a key and significant role in the management of the affairs of the company. That having said that, if someone is unethical, do not shy away from firing them. That's why we talked about that one year cliff. And of course, it's not you who is firing them. Remember, you have your board. So personally, you can't be blamed, but the board will you know, be the backstop for you in that case. Then that person has to be relieved of their due ethics for us is, is paramount because it encompasses many things. So don't shy away. And also even you, you yourself might be the one being let go. Maybe ethical issues, maybe other issues. So you won't have to understand that it is a company you're building. Hence that shareholding cap table situation. Because if you are the one leaving, you still have, let's say you were there for two, three years, you have maybe 20, 30% equity in the company. You are not going to go off empty handed. And so that is a context. You may be the one being fired. You may be the one firing people, but you want to make sure that that company uh, progresses on even without you. Sometimes it's business. No, you know, no hard feelings. And so, um, and I like that idea of sort of like bringing the board of directors into the, uh, into the picture and also looking at the company, the fiduciary responsibility we have for the right. company, not for each other, right? Uh, yeah. And I like that mm -hmm. as an idea. But maybe let's just follow this through. Uh, I guess one fear that someone may be having is, let's imagine I've brought someone on board. Uh, they've hit their one-year cliff. They've gotten their 5% or 10% in this case. And then they have to exit. And now I'm left with someone in the cap table who I'm also wondering, okay, first of all, I have duties and responsibilities uh, towards uh, them because they're a shareholder in the business, right. uh, but they're not active anymore. How yeah. do you manage uh, that kind of situation or what? I guess, how does someone think about that kind of a situation? Because mm -hmm. we are trying to paint different scenarios for anyone who's thinking right. about doing this junk. Yeah, yeah. you can have uh, buyout options. You can have an option to buy them out. Uh, <laughs> at that point, you know, things are pretty dicey. So those are pretty tough conversations because they might not want to be bought out. But yeah, uh, contractually, you can have an option to buy that person out and you have you may have to incentivize them with some uh, premium offer for their 5%. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, the contractually, there are options that you can buy someone out so they don't have to be on the cap table. Yeah. Worst case scenario, which God forbid you get there, is to reorganize the company. 
that is extremely painful. Mm. Yeah. And for those who don't know what organization of a company is, what do you mean by that? Oh, just starting all over again. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 What that you don't want to do that. We've done yeah, it yeah. a couple of times. It's painful. Yeah. But if you, Maybe you look like in... you want to add something. Yes, yeah. I, I do. I do. I, it was actually fascinating me because I wanted to talk about this before I forget. Something about the, you know, the buying out. So one of the things that innovators should be very careful about when you're bringing somebody in just to avoid conflict is to have the structures predetermined for conflict and how to solve them. So that's why I was saying, even when you're starting out, it is very important to have a very solid legal team as young as you are. And that's what I did when I started. It's, you know, you have a lawyer here, you can have having consultations and especially go for IP lawyers. I have one I can recommend in Kenya who's very good. I've been working the journey with her. And then also when this person is coming because you could be having people who bring terms with them when they want to become co-founders. So you have terms like drag along right inside the 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 contract which means that wherever they when you're getting to another investor also they, they also drag along together with uh, the investments that you have we have co-sale rights again these are conversations which are very technical but really talking about the whole um, you know conversation you have with your co-founder so these are the things you should talk about before that in case they arise you have um, a standard operating procedure of how to let go of this person in case it happens. Right. Mm -hmm. That brings a point about arbitration and uh, so, so your contracts will have dispute resolution clauses, some of which include arbitration, bringing in an external party and uh, there are legal understandings about around arbitration so you don't have to go full lawsuit situation. And here we are thinking of mature startups. If you are a one, two person startup, mm, Maybe reorganizing is the way to go. If you're, right. you've already taken uh, investor money, that will, is not going to be an option. So you have to have other dispute resolution mechanisms. Mm. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I like all those, those ideas because indeed you should think about all those things at the beginning. One thing that uh, I've learned is also, you know, almost like, I don't know how to put it, this uh, caller married, uh, almost like when you're getting married, most people don't think about, don't, don't imagine that they'll, one there'll be one day when you wake up and look at the person and ask yourself, what did what was I thinking in this case? And hopefully it doesn't happen to you. <laughs> it has not happened to me. Um, but <laughs> the, the funny thing is that uh, and that's why having the legal representation is very important. And having people who've done this before, who can then give you different scenarios for you to chew on, to think about, uh, so that then you can plan for that. Uh, in the JV that I just mentioned, for whatever reason, we did not have a dispute resolution mechanism. Right. And so when we had disputes, uh, you know, I went back to the agreement. And I was like, oh, my goodness, um, we don't have a dispute resolution mechanism. And so anybody could do anything they wanted to do. But if you had clear, uh, clearly stated that, it would have helped a lot in terms of that uh, discussion in this case. So I, I'm just uh, backing what you guys have just uh, mentioned uh, in this case. Um, now, I've seen a question from uh, Moses Ziga about we need a sequel to this on IP valuation. Points taken. Uh, that's one of the uh, that's one of the key things we'll take for maybe one of the webinars that we host on a regular basis, so that we can also have a conversation around that. Now, as I mentioned, I didn't want us to take too much time. It was supposed to be a part two. We had already discussed quite a bit last time. So my parting question uh, for the, the, the uh, both of you, and I'll start with you, Mary, is just to ask, um, you know, just in summary, uh, what for you would be sort of like the key considerations uh, that you would tell someone if they're thinking of bringing in a co-founder? It's a very open-ended question, but I'm deliberately keeping it uh, open-ended. Um, what for you would be some, some key considerations someone should be having at the back of their mind? Because I know it is a question uh, that uh, a lot of founders are looking at. And in the R2C program, it is somewhere we are trying to push the founders towards because of uh, you know the challenges we mentioned, you know, time, and uh, uh, to a certain extent, also some of them don't have as much experience from a commercialization perspective. So uh, Mary, I don't know what would be your top two, top three that you'd want to put out, especially because you're so going through the same journey. So for me, my top three would be competence, personality, and ethics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so competence is, you're coming to fill in the gaps that you're looking for, and I'm still 
greater rating for us is somebody who has skin in the game in the FMCG space, right? And then in terms of personality, you have to be somebody who is very malleable when it comes to dealing with stress because again, having a startup is a full time, it's a full time and overtime job. So you have 24 hours, 28 hours, you know, going back to back, applying for grants, meeting investors. So you really have to have a person who's flexible and able to hold space for you because it can become quite mentally uh, you know, stressful. And then when it comes to ethics, like Dr. Kenny Karanja said, that is an unnegotiable because the startup business is a very, is a business that operates a lot on public opinion and perception. Mm -hmm. So, and especially in the age of social media, anything that could bring a negative perception or a reputation on the business, and especially on the people you're bringing the company as a co-founder are very critical, which could make investors shy away. That's why I said, we are a female owned business. I cannot bring in a co-founder who has been, you know, has suits when it comes to lawsuits, but I mean, for domestic violence or misogyny or patriarchy. And they're very blatant on social media because that means that Nyungu is also um, taking the image of this person and we are supporting what this person said. So a lot of due diligence as well. Okay, uh, thanks. And I like that point that uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, when you're forming a startup, especially in the current age, uh, public opinion and perception is uh, a very important bit that you need to think about. And so you're always trying to make sure that whoever you're adding, you know, you're bringing to your team is adding to that, not detracting uh, right. from that, uh, what you've built already in this case. Uh, Kenny, same question, but now moving you from uh, maybe the selection uh, point to maybe process-oriented uh, considerations that you may want to just uh, throw out and anything else that you think would be relevant. Right. I, I like Mary's points very I support them 100, I buy into those points 100%. I'm going to segue a little bit and speak more about uh, academic mindset because that's mm -hmm. the space I operate in. And uh, some of these questions are relevant to my points here. Do not be afraid to take on that challenge, to take on that co-founder. I know we've talking about people running off with IP, academic types like myself, we are always afraid who is going to scoop me, who's going to run away with my idea. Remember, it's an idea, at least create something so someone can run away with it, right? Otherwise, if it lives in your head, uh, even the person stealing it has no opportunity. So do not be afraid of taking that leap and founding that company and looking for co-founders. Uh, Process-wise, of course, to reiterate Mary's point, ethical, you want to do the right due diligence. And part of that is hopefully you have a tech transfer organization at, at your institution. If not, there are organizations such as Victoria Ventures that can help you guide guide you through that process. But remember, I, initially you will be doing most of the heavy work. And if you get a very good uh, CEO or co-founder, they might want a substantial part of the company, but remember, if you have done your due diligence right, they align with your mission and vision and uh, ideas around what you're trying to bring. Don't be afraid of uh, making that leap. I, uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. Don't be afraid, create the thing, let it be stolen. At least you can sue them. Otherwise, if it lives in your brain, then you know it, that's where it lives. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kenny. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, uh, for sharing your insights on this uh, uh, topic. And I like those two points uh, of, uh, you know, uh, the competence uh, of the founder, uh, the value system uh, of uh, the founder, and this idea of the public opinion from your, you know, uh, how that contributes to the startup. And so be very clear in terms of the due diligence process. And don't be afraid, right? Uh, other people have done it. Uh, other people will do it after you. Uh, and, you know, there's a friend of mine who says that uh, you can never really make a bad uh, decision in life because especially if you're one of those people who's very reflective and you have a way to correct course, uh, all you can do is keep improving the decisions that you're making, right? right. So you start with someone, it doesn't work, you can uh, change that. Of course, it's a bit more costly at, at times, but at least you, you, you iterate and you move your innovation forward. So uh, thank you very much. We're going to stop at this. Uh, I think you've shared your contacts. I saw your contacts mm -hmm. were shared earlier. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to our speakers, reach out to ourselves as Victoria Ventures. We're happy to on this journey. And uh, yeah, till the next uh, webinar that we host, I'd like to just say a special thank you 
to Dr. Kenny and Mary for sharing their insights on this topic. And to all of you for joining us uh, once again and uh, picking out uh, you know, this topic a, a bit better. And I hope that you've gotten something uh, out of it. Mm -hmm. Do have a lovely rest of the day, Dr. Kenny, and a lovely Thank evening you. for those uh, who are having their evening today. Asante Nisana. All right. Asante Nisana. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.